The Leap Foundation proudly presents the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman. Dr. Bill is a TV host, New York Times bestselling author, two-time Guinness World Book record holder, fitness guru, celebrity cosmetic dentist, and philanthropist who founded the Leap Foundation. Here's Dr. Bill. Hey, you guys. I'm super excited to do another Meet the Mentor with George. You're going to learn all about George in a minute. I'm also super excited because we just found out that Leap can be live. It's not going to just be virtual. That means, John, you need to send your kids too. It will be live. We will have 100 students live at UCLA. The rules are you must be vaccinated in order to attend. That's their rules, not ours, but we're super excited. So Leap will be epic this year. We'll have probably 10 thousand kids virtually and a hundred live so super duper excited the dates for leap uh july 18th to the actually 23rd it will be not where it's always been in the palisades ballroom it will be in the luskin conference center there is a hotel attached to it so if you're 18 and over you can actually stay in the hotel we'll put you in rooms of two if you want or you can have your own room if you're 18 and under you need to stay with a parent. It's still all good. So let me introduce you to George. George Esquivel operates his namesake brand from an atelier in the arts district of downtown LA. He specializes in atelier produ- products and a maximum capacity of only 4,000 pairs of entirely handmade shoes, men's and women's, designated for select retailers and personal clients throughout the world. George was also the creative consultant with Italian heritage brands and Tumi Inc., the renowned luxury bag and luggage brand. George was appointed the creative director from January 2013 to July 2015, where he oversaw the creative direction for design ad campaigns, and was responsible for uniting high-profile designers to collaborate with Tumi, such as public school. George, what else have you done that I missed? I've made a lot of shoes. That's pretty a much it. A lot of shoes. A lot of shoes. I've got to travel the world. Um, amazing experiences with different brands and people. Met some really, really cool people like you that or our friends who introduced us the first. Um, yeah, it's, it's been an amazing career. It's been an amazing career. Let's back up, because, you know, sitting there, people are like, okay, this is like a really cool guy, and he's got the successful shoe company and all that, but it didn't start off so good in the beginning. Why don't you give us a little bit of background on who George is, where you came from, and how you got to where you are right now? All right, so it started off a bit crazy. I- crazy upbringing. Uh, My father was a criminal. We were homeless up until the time I was about 14. Moved in and out of motels a lot. I was the eldest of five. So if you can imagine some of us sleeping in a motel room was just crazy. Uh, Your adolescent years, I think I went to 12 or 13 schools. So super rough. Finally, I get fed up. At 19, I kick my dad out of the house and become head of the household. I'm 19. I'm the eldest of five. And at the time, my escape was music. My girlfriend and I, who's currently my wife, my wife now, we would go to concerts. And that was my escape from being the dad and the father figure, you know, just trying to decompress from all the craziness. Tried college a couple of times, but the stress of being a dad, older brother was just too much. So I got into the music scene in Orange County in the 90s, the punk rockabilly scene that was happening in Orange County in L.A., And I got into vintage clothes, but the vintage clothes and shoes never quite fit me. So they were always off, right? Because they're not, they weren't modern cuts and they fit differently. I'm a size 10 and 9, 10, 11s are always the first sizes to go in vintage stores. So on one of these trips, my wife and I, my girlfriend at the time, we used to go to Baja, tacos, beer for a couple bucks, you know, just to get away. I saw a sign that said boot maker. So I walked in, I asked them, hey, if I give you guys a quick sketch, can you guys make it for me? And they said, yeah, no problem. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, growing up, you could get custom vans made. We could never afford that. 
you can get a custom surfboard made, but I definitely couldn't afford that living in a motel and, you know, just things like that. So four months later, I show up and I'm just freaking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I designed my shoe. And I played around with clothing design, but it just wasn't me. But having this shoe made, it just literally changed me. The passion and something just sparked, right? So at that time, I was driving a truck for a chain of linen stores and also as kind of like a repairman. And my, my route was San Diego to Bakersfield. <clears throat> and this is pre-internet. Now we have kids and I couldn't go to, back to school. I didn't even know where to go to school. How do, you, how do you figure out where do you go to school, learn how to make shoes? So I would stop at every single shoe repair on my route and ask them if they knew anybody who could make me more shoes because making them in Baja was a pain going across the border. I mean, it just, it was too much. Shoes were so cool. So wait, just, I need to back up. You yeah. had zero shoe experience. Zero shoe experience other than- And you're just like trying on vintage clothes, trying on vintage shoes, and like you decide you wanted to make shoes. Just like I, well, that. I wanted to make shoes. You know what, what happened with that first pair of shoes, it was the first time I was getting positive affirmation from my peers. Before growing up, you get a lot of negative, uh, a, a lot of negative attention, right? Your homeless kids look funny because there's not enough clothes. You're wearing the fake sneakers. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't a good upbringing. And now I'm wearing these shoes and I'm getting just a ton of positive affirmation. Like, oh my gosh, what are those? They're so cool. So I... I, I fell in love with that, right? This is the first time that people are actually paying attention to me for not a negative way. <clears throat> so I want more of these shoes. It's not that I wanted to sell. I just wanted more shoes like this for me. I had, I had thoughts in my mind and I didn't know how to get those thoughts out other than I just want to make more shoes. So it took about a year and a half and I found a gentleman outside of LA <clears throat> and he started making shoes for me out of his garage. Very quickly, he got very behind because he was only doing this part time. And we were selling them to, if you look up what we were doing, it was kind of crazy. I think we sold 2,500 pairs of shoes in about two and a half years to musicians, celebrities. And it wasn't like anything special to me. It was more, I'm going to concerts. Hey, what are you wearing? Oh, here's my number. I would just give him my card. And next thing you know, my guy can't keep up with the shoes that I'm delivering to him out of a garage. So I became his apprentice. I said, what can I help you with? I started with organizing his garage. Then he started showing me the other aspects of shoemaking where he was my first mentor. So about two and a half years after that, when we started, he kicked me out of his workshop. He said, George, you're too neurotic. You're too crazy. I can't make you what you want. And besides that, I'm too old and tired. Good luck. So I start moving to different shoemakers to learn more. Now it's just an addiction. I, now I'm going to stores, buying beautifully made Italian shoes and deconstructing them and trying to figure out how to further my craft and really understand this. And things just started moving along and getting better and business was good. And then I would say it, three years after that, he kicked me out of his place. And it was kind of funny because I had just landed my first luxury retailer which was fred siegel on melrose fred siegel feet and yeah. and my guy kicks me out and he says i can't make you what you want you're crazy this is too much and it's not that i was ever crazy i just it's a passion right i'm you're there i was like a little kid like a kid who asked his dad dad how do you do this and how do you do this and he said george we can't answer all your questions it's just you're not even paying us enough so he said here's some machines good luck so I'm like, man, how am I going to make these shoes for Fred Siegel? And I still have a business. Now we're building a made to order business. And I'm, I was kind of a shoe guy showing up to people's houses. And I was working with stylists, musicians, and the business was good. I just didn't understand business and branding and all those things. Yeah, that's the thing I want to ask you about. I mean, you know, you're an artist, you're a craftsman, right? And you're, you're creating this product, but like, how do you make a living doing this? You know, how did you learn the business part? Because that's what that wasn't in your wheelhouse at all. Well, I, I think to some extent it was. It was the hustle. So if my dad was hustling drugs, you learn to hustle, right? 
And it's kind of funny. I just, I learned not to take no for an answer, right? So I had a number, I would have to talk to a hundred people to sell one pair of shoes back then. The numbers are different now because wow. I would hand out a hundred business cards and I would sell one pair of shoes. And I just, I, I wasn't afraid for someone telling me, no, I, for my, my thing was like, look, I've been in worse situations. I've had no clothes, no food, homeless, living in our van. This is pretty amazing. I'm meeting really cool, interesting people. Stanley Silver, when we finally got Fred Siegel, was an amazing mentor. He was the owner of Fred Siegel Feet. And I've just, I, I just wanted to learn. It, to me, it hasn't been about how do I make more money? I wanted to learn the craft because I loved it. And, and I think that's what helped me. Yes, we have, we've made money in and consulting and all that, but I think it's the same thing as being a doctor, right? You got to go to school first and you have to understand that the money comes after you're a trained professional. And, and I remember one of my clients actually told me, they said, you got to learn your craft. The money will come, just be patient. And that's kind of along the ways we've been building the brand. I, I would say that in 2009, there's a competition called the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund. So Vogue and the CFDA, which is the Council Fashion Designers of America, host an event or a competition every year. In 2009, I was one of the 10 finalists, which was, I didn't even know what I got myself into. That's how detached I was because my thing, if you called me up, I would show up, make you some shoes, and that was it. I wasn't really part of the fashion scene. I was servicing people. I was making shoes. Going through this process in 2009, I learned I wanted to have a brand, understand international business, all of these different things. And I met with Anna Wintour. And as one of the finalists, you get mentored. And they, go, they put you through the paces of what do you want to do with your business, how to grow your business. And we had an okay business, but my concept of an okay business wasn't having a major brand because I wasn't exposed to that. I didn't know how you grew a business. So speak with Anna, I meet with her. Um, in case anybody doesn't know, it's the Devil Wars Prada was based on Anna Wintour, an amazing woman. She's helped so many young designers and our new designers. So I meet with her and she says, you need to go back to school. I'm like, well, how am I going to go back to school? I'm married with kids. I'm now 39 years old. And she said, no, silly. You need to start consulting internationally. And me not knowing who she is, I said, well, how am I going to do that? She says, don't worry about it. So they took care of it. And I ended up working with Fratelli Rossetti, which was an Italian heritage brand. Did you go I, back to school? She sent me back to school was me consulting and working with international brands. Oh, That's her, I see. Back to school. So she sets up the consulting projects with an Italian brand. And then I do Chloe, which was a French brand. And then I did a collaboration with Tommy Hilfiger. So all along the way, I'm learning more about international business and big business and how to grow a brand. And I'm just kind of blown away. I can't believe all of these things are happening. And then my last big project was I was the creative director at Toomey Luggage. Uh, so I got to fly to New York a couple times a week from LA and uh, it was a lot of fun. I got to see the world. And then I just decided, you know, all, then I went basically back to school from 10, from 2010 to 2013 or 2015. It was five years of school coupled with what I've known and I understand now we're focused on building our brand. That's amazing. That's amazing. So you have actually been in the shoe business. How many years now, George? Well, I, I designed my first pair 26 years ago. We've been making them in house for about 20 years, meaning we manufacture shoes and we also do accessories, bags and clutches. That's probably within the last six years but we do everything in house. Um, yeah, pretty much. Our sneakers are made overseas. We actually make our sneakers overseas and then we finish them here. It, it looks like you're, you're actually at work right now, right? You're this is my design room right now. What you're seeing behind me is new designs or a mood board uh, for the upcoming seasons. Seasons are a bit wonky right now because of what happened with COVID. It used to be that you would do spring and fall, and then depending on the retailer, so you develop the collection for fall and you show it in the spring, six months out. And the collection for spring you show in the fall. And then some retailers, for example, Barney's before they went out of business, 
They would require a pre-fall or a pre-spring, just different collections throughout the year. Right now, it's still all up in the air. I don't think seasons matter anymore. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. It's all COVID season. Um, it's COVID. So if I am a young student watching this and, and, I, and I want to emulate what you've done with your life and your business, kind of give me a little roadmap. Like, you know, what kind of classes should I be taking in school? You know, what is there, are there workshops or are there, you know, is there people that you follow on social or, or, you know, or seminars that you've gone to that you think would really help somebody? And maybe it's not shoes. Maybe it's just a clothing line or, or any other product. You know, what would you say are kind of the key steps in getting your business up and going? So would you say, is this someone who's already on a certain career path or someone who has no idea? Well, most of my students are 15 to 25, so they're still in school, you know? Yeah. So if somebody is in school right now in college or, or even, you know, high school, and they really find that, you know, clothing is, is their passion and they want to go into the world of fashion or clothing, what are the things that you think would be helpful for them to be doing now while they're in school? I, I think, so let's just say first steps, you don't really know what you want to do, but you want to experiment a little bit. I would start, if you don't have the funds to go to school, some YouTube classes on sketching and drawing, Photoshop, Illustrator. The, one of the things that I didn't learn very well when I was younger is how to sketch and get my ideas out of my head and onto a paper or a computer. And that's key, right? If you don't know how to express yourself, you're never going to be satisfied. You're going to rely too much on a, another graphic artist or another someone who can sketch for you. I would say the more that you can do to get those ideas out of your head to do them. Art classes, drawing classes, graphic design classes. Just start there. Like I, it, Now, if somebody says, I want to be a designer, that's a different case, right? So I want to be designer would be whether it's Parsons or SCAD or FITM, start looking into those schools. Um, and if you don't know what you want to design, but you just love design, it would, it's more of a, an industrial design degree where you get the basis of all design. It could be footwear. It could be toasters. It could be clothes. Um, I have friends who own beautiful clothing lines that didn't get a degree in fashion. They got their degrees in fine arts. So I, I think the creative aspect of school is what I wish I would have done again. And I think it would have helped me a lot. It would have helped me, I guess, propel my business a lot quicker. There's a lot of things that I had to suffer because I didn't know how to do certain things. And I didn't, and I, and also the business aspect, right? When you're in school, you should be taking business classes. There's a lot of people who are artists who don't want to handle the business. I think you need to understand the business aspect of it as well. How much totally things, like true cost of just because it's going to cost you, let's say $5 to make something. You also have to include the driving, the, the time that it takes to package it. All of those things are true costs. And if somebody hasn't taught you that, I remember the first couple of years, like, how am I selling these shoes for this much and not making anything? Well, I wasn't building into the cost, all the other things, my driving, the gas, everything that it required to sell that one or two or 10 pairs of shoes. So I, I think baby steps, YouTube, learning to draw, learning to sketch, see if you like those things, because as a designer, you're gonna be sketching for somebody, maybe as a design assistant, you're gonna be drawing a lot, you're gonna be in front of a computer, and the next steps, if you love it, go on YouTube and start making things. I mean, something I wish we would have had was YouTube. I didn't, there was no YouTube, there was no nothing back then, I had to just stop at every single shoe repair along my, my, my truck route to see who could help me. But so much of your business is really kind of fame and, you know, name recognition. How did you build that part of your business? Well, you know, I, I think part of it was I was at the right, part, right place at the right time, right? So in the 90s and early 2000s, there was this, this movement of music happening in Orange County. No Doubt, The Offspring, Social Distortion, all of Lit, all of these cool bands were happening. And I was just fans and I ended up meeting these bands before they got really big. Um, I also feel that when you do something unique and special and beautiful, people 
that can afford those type of things will seek you out. And, and I don't know, I can't say this is the recipe to, cause that's my goal has never been, I'm going to have, I'm going to have fame and I'm going to make shoes for celebrities. It just kind of happened because I started offering for the, let's take example, the basketball players. It's very difficult to find shoes size 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. I was able to do that. And to me, it's difficult, but I just said, okay, if they need it, why does, might as well make it right. And, and I started filling these niches. I'll, I'll give you an interesting story. So Gwen from No Doubt, Gwen Stefani, I was making shoes out of a garage. And she said to me, George, I want a hot pink bubblegum platform boot. And, and I knew we weren't going to be able to execute it to what she wanted, but I did it anyways. And I did it because I wanted to see if we can do it. And she wore them. They weren't perfect. But at the same time, they were still beautiful and you got to take that chance, right? And you got to take that leap. They she wore them to the Vogue VH1 Fashion Awards. They won an award. And those are my hot pink bubblegum boots. It's just a matter of, I think, also overcoming your fears and realizing you're going to fail a lot, right? If I would have let that fear stop me and not move forward, I would have never made her the boots. And then coincidentally, I started making shoes for the other people in the bands. And then I designed some suits for them. And then they loved what I did. So then they handed my card out to other people where I started making shoes for other musicians. And they've been in videos and in movies. And I mean, I've been blessed with the people I've been able to make shoes for. But I think service first, right? Even in your profession, service right. first. Did you, have you ever worked with a publicist? I've had a publicist, but that was later. I didn't have a publicist until 2010. I'll tell you something. I was really lucky because when I started my dental practice, a woman that I went to high school with, Susan Hartzler, came in like right when I first started. And she said, hey, barter with me. I'm a publicist. I'm like, well, I don't even know what you do. Why do I need this? So she sat me down and read me the riot act and explained why I need a publicist. And I'll yes. be honest with you. It was the smartest thing I ever did in my career because I knew I could do good dentistry, yep. but I needed the whole world to know that, you know, yeah. and you had that through all these popular musicians and celebrities that you were with. I was just a dentist having her get me on all these talk shows as, you know, as a cosmetic dentist really helped my career explode. So you've been doing this for 20 some odd years. You've got this successful business. What's next? I think I, I look, I got another 10 years of this. I, I think what's next is just continuing to develop beautiful product, continue to meet new people, make more products. We do shoes, accessories, I'm now designing for other brands at a different level where I'm not a creative director, but I'm designing for them. Just kind of mentoring as well. Like we like, we love mentoring people, guiding them, um, giving them wisdom. You know, it was, it was hard for me. There was a lot of people who helped once I got into the business, but growing up, there was a lot of people I didn't know who to turn to. How do I move into this field? So I think it's just giving back and keep doing what we're doing. It's not like I said, I have to make X amount of dollars or sell X amount of shoes. I think just keep, keep moving one foot in front of the other, right? And, and doing what we love. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I had somebody in my office yesterday and he's like, why are you still doing this? You know, uh, he goes, I mean, you obviously could retire. I'm like, I love this, you know? And I keep telling my assistant, Pat, she's five years younger than me. I'm going till 80, you go to 75, you know? I mean, what am I going to do? Go retire and play golf? No. That's kind of my thinking as well. It's like, what am I going to do? I got to yeah. I'm 50. What am I going to do? Like, if I was to all of a sudden go from where we're at to I can retire, yeah. like, I, I'm not a golf guy. I'm, I would get bored of mountain biking every day. Uh, maybe t I would probably take up some other things, but I still, I love what we're doing. I think the what you love to do, what I love to do, the creating, the developing, seeing products come to life when designers and, and I think probably even you, when you see your work, the before and after, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And the smiles on your client's yeah. face. 
I'm going to share something with you. When you say, why do you do what you do? I just yes. got this text, like literally before we got on here. This is from a patient and her daughter who I saw yesterday. Thank you for giving us back our smiles. I've never been happier and I'm already feeling more, more confident than I ever have. You do this on a daily basis. This time it was us who won the lottery. You and your team are warm and wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So you asked me, why do I keep doing it? When you can put shoes on somebody and make yeah. them feel like they're like king of the world, that's yeah. awesome. And when yeah. I can put a smile on your face and do the same thing, that's also awesome. I, I think it's amazing. I, I, I'm, so, I'm so blessed that I got to go through all those trials of learning to do this. Because that, those experiences let me realize how important it is to give someone a good service, right? I've had women who come to me, I, I've never been able to wear a high heel because of this, or my legs are too wide, can you make me a knee-high boot? And these are women that can afford anything, but nobody will make it for them. I'm like, I'm going to make you whatever you want. And they feel like princesses or gentlemen who can afford anything, but shoes don't fit them properly, Right. All, and you see the smile, and you're like, that's why. Exactly like you. I'm, I'm here to provide a service. This isn't about being famous or any of that. It's about providing a service. Because I think if, 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 if we're always about providing a service, the, the craft is going to come to the top at some point, whether it's now yeah. or in three years. And it's going to up and down. You know, we, we have a motto. We say craft, not hype. So it's about the craft first. We do that with everything that we do. And the hype will come when it's meant to be. Yeah, you know, that's, that's awesome. That's I can't wait for you to make me shoes. We had a little conversation. I told George, I have the worst feet in the world. They're flat. I have no arch. Everything hurts, but I, I'm excited. So as soon as I get a break, I'm going to come out. We're going to make me some awesome shoes. George, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. Uh, for people listening, sign up for Leap. Um, it will be July 18th to the 23rd in the Luskin Conference Center of UCLA. It will be an awesome, awesome year. All the information is online now. Go to www.leapfoundation.com and you'll get the latest and greatest. With that, Dr. Bill, over and out. To learn more about the Leap Foundation, go to leapfoundation.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash leapfoundation or on Instagram at leapfoundation. Listen to the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.